Okay, so uh, before I get started, re last year, uh, you know, of course, uh, for those that don't know, my name is Ben Ten, and last year I spoke in the main track, and or no, the first the first track, and jokingly ahead of time, Nick said, "Hey, do you need a box to stand on to speak?" <laughs> The funny thing was, is that the podium was actually up here, and I needed a box to stand on to speak. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to po <laughs> welcome to Practical PowerShell Programming for Professional People. Uh, these slides are on SlideShare. Uh, it's Ben Ten Zero XA. All right, so that's where you can get them ahead of time if you want to follow along or afterwards. That link is uh, twice more in this deck, so you'll be able to find that and get that from there. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, it's not Benaxa. It's 10. Uh, no, I'm not the Cartoon Network one. Uh, I don't like to getting the cease and desist for that. Uh, Vice President, Security Officer, I'm a developer. Uh, I created the PoshSec framework, and a gamer and a geek, and you'll kind of see that as we go through this talk. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, it's kind of becoming an annual tradition. I created a contest to win a free ticket to DerbyCon. And so this year, I said, what I want you to do is find a picture of me somewhere and Photoshop me into, an, into a picture. And you get points if you can integrate science fiction, if you can integrate somehow that I'm social engineering somebody, or make fun of the fact that I look like a child. Um, <clears throat> people delivered. <laughs> so here's the first one. Not sure if best offense or worst defense. Security, yay, rainbows. Ben, all you did was connect the jumper cables to the Stargate, now you're just typing hack, 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 hack over and over again. <laughs> Nuclear reactor pen test fail. That was from Norway, by the way. Nigeria, no problem. <laughs> Doesn't have a badge, just wants to surprise daddy at work. <laughs> Yeah. That's Johnny Christmas's hat. We'll get visitor's badge right after I make Tinkle in the data center four hours later. I don't really know computers, but I know block cipher attack vectors. Looks like Johnny Christmas. This is Johnny Christmas's hat, so uh, this is how I get girls' rooms keys. New blinky box never felt more secure. <laughs> Good old Jason Street. Those are not the droids you're looking for. Now this asshole not only put me in a baby carrier, but they put me on C-3PO. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking jerk. And then the winner was uh, Lost in Space. They put me on the little kid's head. A social engineer's way onto the Lost in Space set. So that was bad, so, so she, she did that. So uh, Johnny Christmas, everybody. Johnny, where are you? Raise your hand. Johnny. He did, he did most of the Photoshop on that, so give him a baby hand. Okay, so seriously, I have 75 minutes worth of content, and I'm going to burn through some of the intro stuff really quick because I want to get to the point where you guys can actually see some of the development, and I, I want you guys to, to code right along with me. If you brought your laptops, get it out. Um, we're going to go through and we're going to do each things as we get along. The intent of this talk is not to be that I'm, I'm going to focus on how to automate everything that you have in your environment. I want you to walk out of here with an understanding of PowerShell so that you can grow beyond that. So we're going to talk about just a quick overview of the languages and development. We're going to get right into PowerShell scripting. We will have a script that you can use in your environment right after this. So we'll talk about some resources, some uh, Q&A, and this is mostly live coding. Now. Before we get started, feel free to interrupt. However, we are on a time schedule. So feel free to ask your questions. If you ask me a non-asinine question, I have drink tokens for tonight's party, okay? So I will give these to you if you ask me a good question. I mean, not, it's not that it's stupid, it's just a good one, not an asinine one. So I also have stickers, so make sure you guys come and get those after we're done as well, okay? All right, let's get going. So quickly, we're going to go over styles of coding, syntax, how to get help, and starting out. Before I get going, raise your hand. If you've never scripted before, can you raise your hand, please? OK. What about, what if you think that you are a, about a novice level scripter right now? Can you guys raise your hand? OK. What would you say if you're an intermediate level scripter? Raise your hand. 
Okay, so that so this is the right target audience for what we're trying to do today. Um, how to get help starting out. So there are styles of codings. There's the novice who's you know never done it before, whatever the case may be. You've got your avid scripter who's created a few things, but they really haven't done much. You've got your full-time developer who um, can develop programs and write things if need be, and then you've got your code monkeys. And these are the guys that just fart out code nonstop. So um, I'm a code monkey. I've been doing it since I was 14, so like last year. And uh, so I love coding. It, it's, it's, I, once I got a hold of it and I could tell a computer what to do, I got addicted with it. So this is what I do. I develop all the time. I love writing things. I love learning languages, except COBOL. I hate COBOL. I hate too. Yeah, me too. So this is about where we're hitting in this talk. It's right in between the novice and the avid scripter. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go over some stuff, but I encourage you to go out and get the other resources so you can learn a little bit more. So syntax, uh, for those that don't know, it's the rules that govern how a script or program is developed in a given language. Whenever I learn a new language, I have to understand the syntax. It's like it, it's using the same words, but using it in a different way. It's kind of like, you know, going down south. I, I know you're speaking English, but I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian or uh, Martin. There are things that help with syntax. White space, parentheses, commas, periods, quotes, tabs, braces, curly brackets, colons, semicolons, they all play an integral part in the syntax of a language. And a lot of times, this is where most novice scripters mess up. They use things incorrectly, or they get something from Stack Overflow, they copy and paste it, and then they can't figure out how to get it to work. You have to understand the syntax of the language if you hope to use it. So how do we get help when we want to do that? Well, it, it really is read the effing manual. I mean, that's what it boils down to. If you want to understand how to tell the computer how to do something, you have to either figure out how to get the help. Now, you can do that through the documentation and the reference, but that's not always true because how many actual developers do we have in here? Do we love documentation? Yeah. Yeah. You, you're a liar. <laughs> we hate documentation. We hate writing it. I, 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 I love cranking out the code, but I don't like telling other people how to use it. So, uh, so the documentation is not always the right resource. Um, there's interactive help that you can get. Uh, you can use a question mark, F1. In the uh, PowerShell uh, ISE, there's, there's IntelliSense, which is auto-completion of your command, so you can kind of learn with that. But PowerShell has a command, get hyphen help. Okay, PowerShell is verb noun. Okay, it's very pedantic and asinine. I fought it and then Matt Johnson beat me. So get help. Uh, search engines, great util utility. I know you guys love the Googles and everything, but I hate the Googles. I'm a DuckDuckGo fan. DuckDuckGo? <laughs> yep, DuckDuckGo is so much better in my opinion, at least from the developer standpoint, because they, they get rid of all the fluff and buff and they go straight to the resources that you need. Um, you, here's, a, here's an example of just PowerShell get help. The first three items it gives you are Stack Overflow things. I mean, it's really straight there and right forward. So um, it's what Google was back in 1998. Uh, and that's really why I've moved back over to them. So anyways, use those. Um, speaking of that, uh, anyone know Jimmy Vo? So he, he wanted to be in people's as many decks as possible, so I decided I would add him to my deck. So I created DuckDuckVo. <laughs> so anyways, on with that. All right, so what is PowerShell? PowerShell is a task automation and configuration management framework from Microsoft. It consists of a command line shell and associated scripting language built on the .NET framework. So if you know C Sharp or ASP.NET or VB.NET, you actually are one step ahead of most people who are picking a PowerShell for the first time because it's built on .NET directly. It was created by Jeffrey Snover, Bruce Payette, James Truer, and its initial release was November 14th of 2006. It's been around for a long time. It's only recently been beginning to pick up pick up popularity over the last couple of years, especially when you see people like uh, Armit, um, Mud or um, Raf putting it in Cobalt Strike, and you got PowerSploit, and you got PostSec Mod, and it, it's really becoming a great way uh, to not only maintain your systems, but also to do attack and defense. PowerShell is part of the Windows Management Framework. WMF 5.0 was released April 3rd of this year, and 
when we talk about anything that we're, we're going to be doing today, we're targeting the 3.0. Um, I found that 3.0 is the most widely adopted of the versions right now, and you find some fours around, but three is really a good place for you to guys to start if you're ever going to be doing any of these scripts, especially if you have XP still on your environments. If you do, get them off. So to begin PowerShell, you need WMF 3.0, you need .NET 4.5, a text editor of your choice. If this is your first time scripting, stick with the PowerShell ISE. It's going to help you. It really is. It's going to complete things for you. It's going to highlight things. It's going to put the curly brackets underneath. So that way it'll help you uh, get your script better. Me personally, I use Sublime Text um, just because I like the editor. I think it's really good. Um, so uh, Komodo Edit's also a good one. Uh, both Sublime and Komodo have uh, highlight highlighting for PowerShell in there. So uh, you know, ch you know, choose whatever one you like. But if this is your first time, stick with the ISE. I personally think the ISE is bloated and too big of a footprint. So PowerShell has different file name extensions. It's PS1 for script files, PSM1 for script module files, PSD1 for script manifest files, PS1 XML for formatting and type files, and then the DLLs are the command line and provider assemblies. Don't worry, we're only going to be focusing on the PS1s. Okay? But it's important that you know this is because each file is a little bit different in the way it interacts in the PowerShell environment. So we have command lines, functions, and scripts. A from a functional standpoint, they're, they're the same thing. It, it's just the way that how you call the script that you're creating. Um, batch script, you just run the file, uh, so that would be like a script file. But if you have functions, you can actually make your program flow change, and you can go to the top of the file, to the bottom of the file, in the middle of the file, it doesn't really matter. It's just a way to call the code that you wrote. So a commandlet is actually compiled. Okay, it's compiled in the .NET language, it's very easy to deploy, the help files are easier to write, and it has support for parameter validation. So you can actually go into C Sharp and create a PowerShell commandlet. So you have the full .NET library available to you. A function is written in the PowerShell language, it has to be deployed with a library, meaning it has to be with the automation.dll file. Help is written inside the function, parameter validation has to be done in the function itself. And then the script. This is where we're camping today. Script is written in the PowerShell language. It's invoked by calling the PS1 file, deployed itself by manifest or in a manifest by, by itself by a file, and can contain functions. Now, this, the reason I'm camping here is one, it's the easiest to do, simplest to pick up, and it mirrors the batch scripting that a lot of us have already done. Okay? Before you get started, the set execution policy. If you want to use any of the scripts that you're writing, you need to change this. It's defaulted to restricted, which means only the signed PS1 files that you get will be able to run. Now, there's another option to where you can set the execution pol uh, uh, policy to uh, none, I believe, and don't do that. That's very bad. So set it to remote signed, okay? So there's, this is just kind of what it looks like when you do that. It'll ask you if you want to do it. You just choose yes, and then you move along. All right, so enough of that. Um, before I continue any further, I've not read any books on any language I've ever learned. I, I, I just never do, I've never done it. I don't learn books. I don't learn it that way. I just want to get it out and just start breaking breaking things, just so I can see what I can do. So for me, I'd rather just dive right in. And so that's where we're going to start right now. So let, let's create a Hello World program. It's a, it's the simplest place to start if you've never done any type of coding whatsoever. Uh, ass. All right, so good. So here's our hello world.ps1, and it's just this simple to get hello world to show up on the screen. We're going to do, it's a, remember, it's a verb noun, so it's write, output, you notice the color changed, and then we're going to put some text in there. It's just that simple. Now, there is another way to get um, information to go to the screen. It's called write host. If you use write host, simultaneously a kitten, a puppy, and a turtle all die. <laughs> don't use write host, okay? Use write output. If you use write host, don't tell, you, don't tell them you learned PowerShell from me. All right, so let's come over here. And if I look in my directory here, I can see I've got my hello world.ps1 file. So. To, to, to initiate it, I'm just going to type hello in tab, and you'll notice it puts the dot slash. If you want to run the script, that's how you do it, or you can just use a tab complete. So if I press enter, hello DerbyCon, yay! Yay! 
All right, for those of you that just did that, congratulations, you wrote your first PowerShell script. Oops, wrong slide. You get to look at the pictures of me again. Let's go back to this one, it's so cute. Shift F5, Ben, Shift F5. All right, so there we go, hello world, yay. You're doing a great job, everybody. False, you're doing a great job. All right, so that's great. You got some information out to the screen, so now let's do something with variables. A variable is a symbolic name that you reference in your application that has an associated with a value whose value can be changed. It's different than a constant, hence the name constant, constantly remaining the same. So with a variable, you can actually put something in there and mess around with it. The, when we talk about the term hard-coded, the hello world was hard-coded, meaning we didn't assign it to a variable, we put the string directly into our script. So PowerShell variables are defined by a dollar sign followed by the name that you want to reference. So for example, dollar sign message is a variable. So let's rewrite hello world to use a variable. So we'll come back over here and I'll say message is equal to hello, there back on. And now I will do write host to kill a kitten output message. With me so far? Yes? That was like two of you, great job. And there we go. Still works exactly the same, except for what we've done is we've just put the message into a variable so we can mess around with it and do things later. So let's look at this real quick. What if I did this? Anyone guess what's going to happen? Matt, don't answer. <laughs> no puppies die in the making of this script. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen? Yep. What? Okay, so you think it'll be, but it'll be output with no space. Okay, so let's see if that's true. What happened? But we put it all on one line. We only asked for write output once. So this is, this is an important part and this is something that can catch a lot of people off guard. So this, this is where quotes come into play. Okay, now quotes are very specific in this language. Whereas in other languages you can use a single and a double quote interchangeably and nothing, no one's going to care. In this language it matters. A double quote will attempt to resolve any of the variables before it's printed. So in message one, we have hello. Before it tries to print it out, it's going to pull the value that's inside that variable. Whereas a single quote will print exactly what is between the two single quotes. So let's take a look at that and see what this looks like. So now if I come here and I put double quotes around it, did you notice, notice something here? This, you notice the color on that? Still the same, even though it's between quotes and it's a string. So if I come here, now it works. But if I come over here, what did you guys notice about the dollar sign? It changed, it changed color. So now when I run this, it shows exactly what's there. Don't get hung up on there. Double and single quotes do not operate the same. Okay, you guys with me? Two of you, good. So what if we want specific characters like the dollar sign to be printed or whatever the case may be? That's where you come in with the back tick. The back tick, or it's also called the grave accent, is a special escape character. This means you want the next character to be printed exact and not interpreted in any way. So let's say I wanted to display what my values were in between these two guys. This is good for debugging. So I want to say message one is equal to whatever the value is. So I'll actually do a back tick and I'll say message one is equal to this and back tick message two is equal to this. See the difference in the color here? It means it's going to display the dollar sign that which means now it's not going to look at it as though it's a variable. So if I run this, Message one is equal to hello, message two is equal to DerbyCon. This is great for debugging if you want to see what the values of these things are and you want to show that on the screen. This is a great way for you to do that. So that backtick character is special. It's also good for when you want to actually display a dollar sign. All right, so we showed you that. Good. So write output is great. 
Is write host a good idea? No, no, no. But how do you get information from the user? It's read host. And this is why a lot of people assume to use write host. Um, but don't use write host, seriously. Um, they, they die. They really do. True story. So let's get some information from the user. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say message is equal to enter your name. Now, whatever I get from the user, I want to store in my variables. So I'm going to say name is equal to read host message. Now, I could hard code the message in there, but just for our example. And then what I'll do is I'll say write output, hello, name. With me? Am I going too fast? You're good. So let's see what happens when we do that. Enter my name. Benton. Benoxa. Hello, Benoxa. All right. That's the simplest way to do it. I'm not going to camp too long here just because we have a lot of content to cover. All right. We're going to get into conditional logics now. So a conditional logic is a feature of a programming language which perform a different set of computations or actions. Okay, you know what? I hate this definition. It's a decision. And you make, you look at a condition and you say, if this evalu evaluates to true, do this. If it doesn't, do this. Think of, I'm from Chicago, so I'm going to use a stoplight example. If the light's green, keep going. If the light's red, stop. If the light is yellow, floor it and run over pedestrians. Okay? That's conditional logic right there. You make that decision. So the way that we do that in PowerShell is using the if, the else, the else if, and there's also a switch. The switch will evaluate multiple conditions at the same time. It won't use the, a single line at once. It'll actually do multiple. If is where we're going to start for what we're learning today. This is the most asinine thing that PowerShell has done. Instead of using the at, at, or the pipe, they have to do these asinine hyphen and and hyphen or. It's asinine, Matt. Shut up. <laughs> it's, it's totally asinine because, you know, if, even C Sharp doesn't have to deal with this stupid stuff. But anyways, the way you do it is hyphen and and hyphen or. I did this talk in Conver at Converge, and I did, I did at at instead of the and, and I, my script bombed. So anyways, it's hyphen and, hyphen or. And then there's also equals, less than, greater than, not equal, greater than or equal or less than or equal. You guys can download these slides to pull this up, so we're just going to burn through it, all right? Like, not like, match, not match contains many different operations that you guys can use, so go look, go look at those. So let's see what our script looks like if we enter in some conditional uh, logic here. So we'll leave this the same, and now we'll say if name is equal to Ben 10, I want a different message than normally. So I'm going to say write, output, that guy sucks. Self-deprecation. Yay! And then we'll put this guy back up here. OK? So this is my conditional logic. This is basically saying, I want you to do the, this line right here. If this condition evaluates to true, if it doesn't, then go do this one. So let's take a look and see if our script works. Enter my name, Ben. OK, so it worked. It, was, it wasn't Ben 10, so I got the valid message. If I put in Ben 10, there we go. So there's our first set of conditional logics that basically we can begin to make decisions off of the data and information that we have. All right, let's keep going. This, how many of you guys have ever been hung up on operator precedents, developers? Yeah, there should be more of you guys raising your hands because this this messes people up so bad. Okay, so operator precedence in PowerShell works left to right. When, you, when you're looking at the conditional logic, it's going to work left to right, except on your negation operators, not or binary not. Okay, then it works right to left. There are ways to override this, and that's by enclosing things in a parenthesis. And that way, it's just like math. Whatever's in the parentheses, you do that first, then you do everything else. Got it? Good. So let's, let's write a situation to where our conditional logic will actually give us incorrect output. Okay? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say uh, security group equals read 
host, enter your security group. Okay. Now, what I want to do is if the name is Ben 10 and the security group is equal to burbsec, so I'll say and. Look, see, do you guys see what I just did? Asinine. Okay, and the name is Ben 10, then do that guy sucks. Or if the security group is equal to DTHOM, that's Derek Tomics, everybody. Woo! Shush. And, uh, or, or, sorry, this should be my sec. And name is equal to DTHAM. Okay? So the condition, let me go back. I know this is big font, so everything runs off. If the security group is burpsec and Ben 10, or it's my sec and DTOM, then put that guy sucks, otherwise write the name. Now, how many of you guys think this is going to be successful? Shouldn't be, because I just told you we were going to write one that was going to fail. So let's write, let's test it. If I put Ben and Derby, okay, it works fine. If I do Ben 10 and Derby, it works fine. Because again, it's remember, it's Ben 10 and Burpsec. What if I do DTOM and MySec? Okay, that works so far. Hold on, let's see this one. It failed. The condition logic said if it's Ben 10 and Burbsec, then display our first message. I mean, that's what it says right here. If security group equals Burbsec. But remember, it works left to right. So it evaluated, after this or, it evaluated these conditions. That's why DTOM worked and Ben 10 didn't. It's all about operator precedence. So to fix this, we put it around this group here, put parentheses, or here. And now I'm changing the operator precedence of this conditional logic so that it can work the way that I want it to work. So let's see if this works now. There we go. Make sense? Good. Don't get hung up on that, guys. All right, operator uh, conditional logic. Let's talk about parameters. Parameters are variables that allow you to pass an object to a commandlet function or script. This is how you can take information from another script or from another uh, world and pass it into the PowerShell function module or script. Uh, so let's take a look at get child item, which is a cool uh, little commandlet that was written by, uh, that's, that comes native. So if we do get child item, um, it'll actually display the files that are on my system. Ignore the donkey porn. Um, that's normal, I guess. Um, so this will display all of the things that are on there. If we look at uh, the get help for get child item, hold on, let me clear that we're not typing on the bottom of the screen. Okay, it basically displays everything that's going on, and I can't see my arrows. There we go. So it displays everything, and you can, if you scroll all the way up to the top, it tells you exactly how to use it. All of those hyphens are the parameters. This is how you can pass stuff to it. So as you can see, that we have a we have a hyphen path. So let's go ahead and do the get child item again, and we'll specify a path, and we'll take it to a different directory. Okay. So those are parameters, and based on what you do, is how you can interact with that script. Um, so when you're looking at the when you're looking at how to utilize one of the commandlets or functions, make sure you understand what all of the parameters are, so you can interact with it efe efficiently. We already showed all that. Now, PowerShell is object based. Just because it displays text on the screen doesn't mean you're interacting with a string. And even a string is an object. This is very difficult for a lot of people to understand. Um, they automatically assume if it's text on the screen, then that means it's a string. That's not, that's not the case. Everything that's returned is returning, is returning as a string unless you explicitly say, um, write it as a string. Okay? But even the string is an object. So let's take a look at something here. If I do get child item, 
Uh, let's do the path so it's not eating up our whole screen. Okay. So this is a similar output that we've seen from command prompt and everything else like that. We've got mode, last write time, length, and name. What's cool is that I can reference any one of these columns. So I can actually say, if I say files equals get child item path cpsf, okay, so all of my stuff is here in files now, I can actually just say files.name. And I can access all sorts of different information based off of that because it's an object, which makes, which allows you to do great things and wonderful, powerful things just by accessing that object now. So piping. Piping is a way from mo of moving something unchanged from one place to another. Uh, so its pipe is represented by the pipe character and it takes the object from the left side and moves it to the right. When it's on the right side of the pipe, the way that you reference the object that was passed is with dollar sign underscore. That is a reserved variable name. You can't use dollar sign underscore for your variables. And that is specifically for piping. So let's take a look at this. So if I say get child item path PSF, I'm going to take the files object that was created and I'm going to send it over to where object and I'm going to put my, put it, this is my logic brace brackets now and I'm going to say this is how I reference the object that was passed. The name is equal to logs. You got it? And there we go. So that's how you pass that information over. Everyone, Dave Kennedy. Dave Kennedy, everybody. Get object GTFO. <laughs> All right, so that was piping. How much time, you know, how, where am I? Let's see. Okay, I'm good. 20 minutes. We can do it. Loops. Loops are a way to perform the same block of code for a specific number of times until a specific condition is met or while a specific condition exists. So there are many ways to represent loops for each, for each object, for while, do, until, and whatever. I'm just going to show you a for each loop. This is where you're going to go back and do a little bit more research on how to build each of these loops when you're dealing with your thing. Each of them is, is, is used in a specific instance. You're not going to always for each everything because there may not be a, a, a specific number of items that you can use. So you may want to use a while or until or whatever the case may be. So let's go ahead and look at a for each. So here's a loop. So we're going to use a similar uh, thing that we just did. But instead of me piping that file over to a conditional, I'm going to say for each object, which is a built-in. This is what I want you to do. For each one of those file objects that I get, I want you to write, you are such a jerk. <laughs> the hairs on the back of my neck went straight up. <laughs> All right, so write output. Oh, man, jeez. Uh, ah, woo. That was creepy, dude. He had, a, he had like a light uh, flashlight in his pocket too, man. <laughs> That's going on the internet. <laughs> so write output, I'm going to reference that, and I'm gonna, just going to reference the variable that's in there. Now, understand, there's many ways to do exactly what I just did. I'm just showing you what a loop does, right? I'm not trying to... Uh, yes, you could do get child item where name equals this and filter out on the, the just the name uh, 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 field that goes along with that. I'm just exp it's showing you what you can do. So you could even come back here and you could say write output file name is equal to and then I'm going to put this guy in this. Okay. Now, do you guys see what I just did with the with the brackets uh, with the parentheses here? Okay. The reason I did this is to make sure that it interprets that as an actual name and not the word name. So there you go. So you can see it's more than just that. I actually modified the content of that name before I displayed it to the screen. 
You with me? Good. Excellent. Let's move on. If not, deal with it. Okay. Comments quickly. Uh, comments are amazing. Developers, especially code monkeys, we hate uh, writing comments on the code because we know what we're doing and screw everyone else. Um, I don't know what I've I've written, went back to my code that was like five years ago when I was three, and um, I have no idea what I did. I have no idea why I did it. It was horrible. And so um, comments are defined. You can just use the pound sign, but if you want a block comment, you can use the less than and greater than for the comments. And it kind of looks like this. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a quick comment for our file. So I'm going to come back up here. And you notice everything changed color. So I'm going to put this like this. And there's my little comment block at the top. Now there are things that you can use to reference that. Uh, they are, let me go back, uh, synopsis, description, parameter, example. These are the most popular ones. There are more, but these are the most popular ones that you can use. Um, so if I come back over here, I can say dot synopsis, synopsis, there we go. Uh, this gives a quick overview. This is my script, description, manual, and example. This is how I invoke my script. So we'll just say hello world.ps1. Okay? Quick little way of doing it, and we go from there. Okay? Good. Moving on. So let's talk about the final program. This is the one that you can actually take and go back. I'm actually doing all right on time. That's great. Uh, this is the final program. Now, this is something you can actually go back and use. We had an incident uh, where uh, one of our users was able to download and execute a remote admin control utility which bypassed all of our security. And it was very clever, very unique in the way that it did it. It actually set up its own local web service and then hooked back into that and then tunneled back out. Very cool. Um, it sucked for me, but it was very cool. Um, so what we wanted to see is if it changed any of those files. And so I wrote a quick PowerShell script because I just wanted to see what files might have changed within that given period of time. And so this is, this, this is something that you guys can utilize back at your office and you can build on it. All right, so we're going to search all of our files. We're going to find the ones that were modified in a specific date range, and we're going to create a list of those files and display it. Okay? So in the interest of time, so I'm not just sitting there typing it all and messing it up, I've already done it. So we'll kind of go through it. You guys are welcome to type along. This, this, this code, and, code and everything is on my site, so you can download it later. But uh, again, quick little description of what the site's going to do, synopsis, how to run it. So the first thing we do at line 14 is we get the files. We've seen this already. Now, there is a, another parameter on there called recurse, which is recursive. It goes through each of the individual folders and grabs them. This is a collection. So at open close is a collection, which means I'm going to fill this collection with individual files if I find them. Because I don't want to send all of the files over there. I only want to send the ones that meet my specific conditional logic. So I'm going to check to see if I have anything, if this object is null. And the way you reference null in PowerShell is dollar $null. OK? Then I'll go through each of the files. So here's our loop, which we learned. So for each file, which means I'm creating a variable called file, in the collection files, I'm going to have my conditional logic of if the file, the last right time, is greater than or equal to 6-1 at midnight, and the last write time is less than or equal to 6-30 at 11-59. So basically, I want to see if anything's changed in the month of June. If it is, then I want to add that file, the full name, to this list collection. And you can use the plus equal to do that. You could also say plus list equal plus whatever, but it's easier just to say plus equal. OK, so there's my brackets. I check to see, before I write any output, I check to see if my object is null. These are called sanity checks, folks. Don't just assume that just because you have an object that it's not null. These are my sanity checks. This is good programming logic. Think this way. Just because you get something doesn't mean it is what, it th what you think it is. So if it's not null and the length is zero, yeah. Are you asking me if I add sanity checks before or after? So I write sanity checks as I'm writing it. It's just become something that I've done as a habit just because it's bit me in the ass so many times. Yeah. Oh, by the way, great question. Come on. 
Yeah. No. No, it's not case sensitive in PowerShell. No, not at all. Here, you, you can come up and grab one too. All right. Just so I don't run out of time here. You don't get a drink token for a comment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. So you, it, it, yeah. So the the comment was is that um, some people will actually write out all of their comments ahead of time and then go back and code. That's called pseudo coding. So basically, uh, if you if most people most people don't know what a flowchart is anymore. I, <laughs> so it's, besides a hierarchical chart from your organization, they don't. I mean, Visio is not used for much of anything else anymore. Um, but th basically, it's a way to actually put your logic into words so that you can actually wrap code around it. Um, you can come get a token. Uh, so let me finish this up real quick. Uh, so if the list is not equal to null, then we check the length and write up the list. If it if it we if we don't have anything in the list, that means we did we had files, but we couldn't find anything. However, if remember, let's go back up to the top. Our first check was if files was null, my sanity check, I'm going to say no files were found. So let's go ahead and take a look at this script. And I'll say hello world final. Oh, let's go back. Hold on. Dirt. So if we look, we can see that I have two files here. Dream big, you know, because I'm short. And Ken Ham, okay? So these are the two files that were modified in our given date range. So if our script works correctly, we should get those two. And there we go. All right. Ooh. What? Yes. Uh, readability. Yeah. So tabs are not. You can actually put everything that I just showed you on a single line. Um, the reason that I'm showing it to you this way is because I've helped multiple people who have gotten something off of Stack Overflow as a single line and they can't debug it. Okay? So learn it this way first and then go back and you can optimize it. But you can put most, every, everything I just did, you can do in a one-liner. And if you go into some channels, uh, they, they're very one-liner, um, I, okay, so I don't, I don't sit in this channel anymore just because it pissed me off, but, um, they, they, it's, it's one liner everything. I, I don't want you guys to do it that way. If this is your first time, get the white space, get the tabbing in there just so you understand what you're reading, and then go back and change it. All right? So that's a great segue because these are my pitfalls. Don't overuse pipe, okay? Not everything has to be done in a single line. Use the object. Learn what you're doing before you start using the piping, uh, uh, a lot. Um, it's more important that you understand what your code is doing before you try and condense it. It's gr Answer! Yep. I can't see anybody over there, so th it's a train. That's all I see is a light. Go ahead. You mean sanitize this right here? This, this, the full name is a string object. Okay, so there's no, um, there's no, like, risk in not using Oh, so you're, you're, you're trying to make sure that I'm, the uh, sanity check here to make sure that full name is full name. When you return the object in, in PowerShell, the only thing that I can get when I access that is a string. There's no way that I can get anything else. It, it, it's kind of like saying, is a string a string? And you can do something like this. You can do get member. So if I do string, uh, if I do this, if I do files equals get child item, okay, and I use this thing called get member, okay, these are the, all the accesses things that I can access from that files thing. And you can see that there's methods that you can do, so you can use a copy to, whatever the case may be. But if we look at the full name, it's actually a property value, which is a string. Does that, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, it's called the power exploit. 
Yeah, so there's, there's plenty of different things that you can do with that. But for this script right here, um, you know, in, unless you've got a file name with a, with a, uh, a script in it, it's, it's, but it's still not going to run. Like you can't name a file name a PowerShell command because it's going to return it as a string and it's not going to interpret it. It was that a true question? Okay, great. Perfect. You can come get a token. Huh? Oh, for this command that I just did, it's uh, files, and I piped it to the get member command line. Got it? Two? Let's keep going. I only have a few minutes left, and I want to make sure we have time for some more questions. Okay. Uh, yep. I have no idea where you are. What? Say that again. Oh, so do we have to initialize the file variable? So like you're saying, like create var files or whatever the case may be? Yeah. So you don't have to. Uh, once you do this, now this is, this is not strong typed. This is soft typed. I could say string if I wanted to, you know, to make that or a collection or whatever the case may be. Um, but no, you don't have to. Uh, so let me finish up so that way we, we can let the other speaker in and then I will definitely be out back and don't forget to get stickers, but hold on. Um, these are some great resources. Um, Freenode, a uh, bunch of us, uh, Carlos, Oper uh, Dark Operator, myself, Matt Johnson, a lot of other people are on the PS Sec channel and the Posh Sec channels. Uh, a book that I heard was really good was Learn Windows PowerShell in the Month of Lunches with Don Jones. And then Carlos Perez is an amazing, amazing resources. Uh, if you get a chance, go to one of his trainings. I actually snuck into his training here um, uh, at DerbyCon this year, and he didn't even know that I was sitting in there. Um, I didn't have a ticket. So uh, you, there's also great tools that you guys can use that are built on PowerShell. Uh, the defense mech, the, from the defense world, we've got PoshSec. Uh, that's Matt Johnson and myself. Um, I've got some PoshSec stickers if you guys want some. Uh, PowerSploit, which is Manifestation and Chris Campbell. Uh, PoshSec Mod, again, from Dark Operator. I encourage you guys to go take a look at those uh, resources. Um, again, you can go to SlideShare to grab these slides. Big thanks to all of these people. If you're not following these people, make sure you do that. Um, quickly take a snap of that. Uh, these are great people. Thanks for uh, DerbyCon for letting me speak again and for Dave being a jerk. And uh, so this is how you get a hold of me, uh, Benoxa.com, on Benoxa on Twitter, web at Benoxa, and so forth and so on. Uh, questions, anyone else? I've got a few more tokens up here, so you could, hopefully you got some buttons. Yeah, go ahead. Say it one more time. Yeah, that, that was the parameters that we showed you, like on the get child item with the path. Those are the, the the parameters and stuff that you can pass into it, and you can do that directly in the scripts that you're writing as well. Yep. Come get a ticket. Yeah, go ahead. So equals an assignment, right? So I'm going to say whatever is in there, I want to be put in there. Come get some stickers too if you guys want some. Um, uh, if if it's an assignment variable, and then uh, you know what. I'll answer your question here in a second. I, I don't want to be too late. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.